Welcome to another episode of the CPG Guys podcast. Our co-hosts, Sri Rajagopalan and Peter V.S. Bond, explore how brands and retailers engage with consumers online, in-store, and everywhere in between. And now, here are Sri and Peter. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the CPG Guys podcast. I'm your co-host, Peter V.S. Bond. I'm also the Vice President of Retail Strategy at Power Reviews, the product ratings and reviews software company. As always, I'm joined by my co-host. He's an e-commerce veteran of notable CPG companies like, oh, PepsiCo, J&J, Revlon. <laughs> nah, you haven't heard any of those. Uh, he's also an accomplished entrepreneur. He's uh, the Lenny to my squiggy, the clinger to my radar, and the cliff to my norm. Boy, is that just like 70s and 80s TV? Ooh. Uh, and, uh, we're at, us, man. and we're live together. We have, uh, we have an invisible piece of plexiglass between us to, you know, socially safe distance, but, um, it's actually amazing Photoshop. It, it is Photoshop. Yeah. So, uh, join me in welcoming the man known as Shri. Shri, how are you? Far too kind, Peter, as always a pleasure doing this with you. Yeah. And I can't believe we are 45 plus episodes in. Wow. 45 episodes. That, what's that in dog years? That's, oh that's I long, don't know, man. That's a long time. And when I'm not doing this. What are you I've, doing? When I'm not doing this, yeah. I've also helped launch brand Zenfuel. What is this? A 100% natural supplements brand to help aid your sleep, energy, better movement, stress, and anxiety relief, and male sexual wellness. Ah. Do check it out at www.zenfuel.com, spelled Z-E-N-F-U-E-L. Can you find it somewhere else? Where else can you find that? Hmm. Amazon brand. Amazon. Just Heard search for Heard Zenfuel on Amazon okay. and coming soon at other retailers too. Where your happiness is our ambition. All right. Enough of our shameless, shameless self-promotions. I want to remind our audience that you can find all of our content. Our audio podcast is on over 15 platforms. We have a YouTube channel that has playlists from our profit series, our retail series, our women leader series, so much more. Just go to cpgguys.com. And we also like to promote other great podcasts uh, that people can listen to. Uh, Today, we're going to talk about our good friend, Sean Halter, who runs the CMO Suite. He is a great marketing leader with guests from brands and agencies. So please check out the CMO Suite. So let's get to our, uh, the reason why we're here today. So I met our guest uh, five years ago when she was leading commercialization for a whole bunch of what we call non-carbonated beverage brands at the Coca-Cola company. I stormed my way in with some data to try and help her with the product launch she was doing on liquid water enhancer. And she thought, wow, okay, who's this weird guy? But the data seems to be meaningful. And that's how we started our our friendship. And she was there for a couple of years. Then she took over ownership of the target team in Minneapolis. Uh, And after a couple of years in Minneapolis, I think she was tired of the balmy weather there. So she packed up her bags, moved to the East Coast, where she led national sales for Heineken USA. So a lot of big brands that we're familiar with there. I've heard of the brand. I've heard of them too. And then fairly recently, she decided to leave the big corporate world and join what many would call an emerging startup type of a brand, which is Calypso Lemonade, which is run by a company called King Juice. Please join me in welcoming Bridget McCarthy Glasda. Bridget, how are you? I'm great. I'm great. Peter Shree, thanks for having me. I'm excited. Shree and I are always well, uh, happy to welcome a veteran of the beverage industry. Uh, but for the purposes, he went to he was he was a Pepsi guy in your coke. We're going to keep the cola wars civil. We want civility right now in this world. Yeah. We need happiness. We'll talk only Aquafina um, and Dasani. That's fair game. But before we get into the questions, Bridget, could you share with us um, what your role is uh, and at, at King Juice and the Calypso brand and, and tell us a little bit about the business that you're in? Yeah, yeah. So I am actually the chief customer officer. I lead sales for King Juice Calypso um, domestically and internationally. We actually have uh, quite a quite a decent international business now. Calypso, got one of these in front of me right here, Island Wave. It was one of our new innovations. Calypso, the brand has actually been around for 20 years. And oh. 
yeah, yeah. So 20 years, but we, it, it still does feel like an emerging brand. Um, I mean, we're, we're still up and coming and we're having, you know, two of the best years right now, but so I lead sales. And uh, like I said, Calypso has been around for 20 years. We are the fastest turning lemonade in the category and it's a ton of fun uh, based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Bridget, did I see pictures of you on social media launching your brand in Hawaii not too long ago? You did. You did. Yes. So we did launch in Hawaii earlier this year. Um, we're actually going to do a relaunch. We had some change in with our distributor there. So we're going to go back in February. But yes, we had never been in Hawaii. I mean, it's really tough to get products there, uh, but found a distributor and uh, was launched right before COVID actually. So I was I was lucky enough to get out there and, and get Calypso in Hawaii. I've never heard of that place, but can I help you go distribute yeah, when I you know. get there in February? Shameless, shameless. I, yeah, I tried yeah. for years to get CVS to send me to, to, to Hawaii. I told them I was going to share data on spam. It I've only seen it on the map. Yeah. All right, let's get to the questions, Bridget. Let's, let's, cut, let's cut right in. So right. you joined Coca-Cola straight out of college and had a successive set of experiences that you honed at Coke that... that that moved you up the career. What were some of the skill sets that, that you think served you well from working at such an iconic organization like Coca-Cola? Yeah, I think about my time at Coke um, and at Heineken a lot, having joined um, King Juice, you know, from uh, starting out as an account manager, you know, you are hustling. And my role at, you know, my, my title is, I do much more like many people do, but you know, I'm also an account manager every day. I manage our Walmart business. So it's not like, you know, it's not like running these massive sales companies with these uh, global brands, you know, I'm actually doing a lot of the work plus leading the team. So I think having that experience was really helpful as I move, as I move with King Juice and are working with a 20 person sales team and we're out there grinding it out. You know, we are, we are the emerging brand. We're competing against the, the likes of a Coke or, you know, uh, Pepsi and all the big name brands. So some of the experiences though at Coke that I've taken with me are, you know, being in a big organization like that and you have so many resources and so many people um, and the, the levels of which you interact with people at, at the retailer, you see what can be done. You know, because at an emerging company or at smaller brand companies, um, you know, a lot of times you're working with smaller groups of people within a retailer, where when I was at Coke leading the Target team, you know, we were working with nearly everyone within Target. It wasn't just the grocery buyer. So I really got to see like what could be. You go to top to tops with presidents and CEOs and you see all of the resources and the way that you can develop a customer. And again, at, a, at an emerging company, you have fewer resources, but you figure out a way to, to, to get it done. And, but you see what's possible. And I think that's been what's really cool about my experience at Coke and then having that vision and what we could do with uh, Calypso. Great. So speaking of your, first of all, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. Especially uh, fellow beverage alum. Yeah. And uh, if I look through your career, you know, obviously Coca-Cola was a big part of it, but you've been in the beverage sector for quite a while. When you first got to Heineken, it was, while it's still beverages, it's a very different category than carbonated drinks or still water or sparkling water and juices and things of that nature because it has alcohol, aka beer. Mm -hmm. So when you first got there, what were some of the things that hit you right in the face? Like what were some of those complications, challenges, opportunities, anything that surprised you in the first place and any rigid rules you had to follow in terms of there's no way or the highway? Mm -hmm. Yeah, be, being an alcohol is way more complicated than non-alc. You know, so going from Coke and, you know, I, I started with Coke Enterprises, which was the U.S. distributor before Coke, you know, bought and, and sold all of that. But working with the distributor there, the, the distributors within the Coke system, same with that Pepsi, they're only Coke or Pepsi distributors. You're not competing with, um, although you've got, you know, a couple different water brands, you're not competing with other companies to get share of mine within those distributors. Go, going to Heineken, there were something like over 350 distributors in the US. 
So it's working with this insane network across the U.S. and influencing at a different level. You know, you'd have to, I'd have to influence at Coke to get the distributors to buy off on it. Again, I'll go to Target if we wanted to do a program at Target and we needed to, you know, gain funding and, and all of that. But at Heineken, you know, you're working with 375 different companies and you are a really small player in the scheme of things. So being able to influence and, and, and get through all that clutter to get more share of time for you know increased execution and all of that was a lot more complex than it was at Coke. I would say the laws within beer and alcohol, you know, what you can and can't do. I mean, even how much in different states and within states like counties, how much you can give away to a, a consumer if you're an alcoholic product. You know, there was just a lot more, there were a lot more rules. We, I, I got really tight with our legal team at Heineken and different from Coke, we did more legal training. So we were always keeping our team up to speed on the laws to make sure that you didn't get yourself in trouble because it could cost companies, you know, significant amount of dollars if you did something that was against the law. So you wanted to keep everybody employed and not get run into fines. So we did a lot of legal training. Um, to make sure that we stayed up with that. So a, a lot of different complexities with alcohol and the laws. Compliance, always. Shakespeare was right, first thing. Let's get all the lawyers. Anyhow, yeah. all right. So you spent a big chunk of your career at Coke, very well-known organization, Heineken USA, a well-regarded brand. All of a sudden, this opportunity comes up to join, albeit a 20-year-old, but still, Mm -hmm. an emerging brand that's looking to grow rapidly. What drew you to the opportunity? What was exciting about the, the, the company? You know, I had amazing experiences at both Coke and Heineken. And I was, I was with Coke for about 14 years when I left to go work for Heineken. And, you know, that was probably the hardest decision that I'd made for my career. So when I made the decision to leave Coke, leaving somewhere else was just a little easier because Coke was where I grew up in my career. So after, you know, at Heineken, uh, it was about three years or so, a little bit more than three years. And I'd had, you know, 17 years in big company, all beverage. And so I was looking for just some different experiences and I had done the big company thing and I was interested in more, something more entrepreneurial, something more startup, something where I could own more of the business and learn more about running a business and all of that. You know, uh, there are a lot of opportunities within big companies to learn different aspects of the business, but there are really only a few true P&L owners in big businesses. And so um, that's, you know, that's something that was really interesting to me. King Juice is owned by a private equity firm, Mason Wells. That was also something that was interesting to me, learning more about private equity and all of that. And, and really just the opportunity to take a, a longtime brand and work with an awesome management team. David Clodson's our CEO and, and he's phenomenal and really build something and like leave your mark where you could, you could really see it. And so I was excited to, to, you know, get my hands dirtier and get closer to the customer. And uh, I'm very competitive. So I was looking to, you know, get back and do that. And I, I miss non-alc also. I missed that. And, uh, and Calypso is really fun brand. Yeah. And so that's, that's something that really attracted me to Calypso, you know, um, looking at the bottle here. And it's like, a vacation in a bottle is a lot of times how we how we refer to it and it's just so fun and the drink is delicious and amazing and uh yeah it's been all around a good time you know i have a friend of mine who recently joined party city and she said to me who doesn't want to go to a company that's all about fun right, right. and who and what do we need more than anything in 2020 we need some fun. So good on you, Bridget. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, we need vacation yeah. in a bottle. Yeah, you do. Right. You need this vacation in a bottle. When you can't travel here, you can just like open up and you're, you're, you're on the beach just like that. So speaking of being competitive, let's talk about trade rates. You know, the trade requirements you faced over your career have obviously been transforming from the old days of the in-store only distribution model, primarily via Distributors, we've already talked about it in an earlier episode to today's omni-channel world, mm -hmm. where a lot is actually done with the consumer online, as well as with the retailer. So what was needed 
what's needed for an omni-channel retailer is so much more demanding than just a brick and mortar retailer. At least from the years I've spent in e-commerce, I've felt that myself as I had to transition out of brick and mortar. So can you share with us in this new omni-channel world, what are retailers having a conversation with you about on the omni-channel piece, especially in terms of capabilities and when you list product, is it all about the digital shelf? Because I feel that's what today's packaging is. That's how products get, you know, your brand and product gets presented to a retailer. Do the images matter? Like what, what matters the most? For sure, hands down, the images. And I can speak from some recent experiences now as Calypso, we went through a um, rebranding. So we have a new visual identity um, that launched, you know, before 2019. And so I'll even find it sometimes online, you know, if we'll Google or, or look at some current retailers and, and we may not have gotten them updated images and you can really tell a massive difference. We saw a significant increase in our sales last year and our distribution was up slightly, but the majority of the volume came from an increase in velocity and rate of sale. And a lot of what we can attribute that to is a cleaner label, just cleaner visual identity. So then taking that to online, if, if, if you're going on to your preferred retailer and you're searching, the images really make a difference, something that's going to stand out. The other thing is order. And we haven't even really gotten into this conversation with our customers, but we started doing this at Heineken is the order in which your product shows up in searches. So at Heineken, for example, if you're to type in beer, it's like, well, who shows up first? Either they do it alphabetically or there's some, there's some way that a brand shows up first. And so I think those are some of the conversations to have and be having with the retailer. It's what's that digital shelf and for sure, suppliers need to make sure that all the images are updated, that you really show up as you want to on the digital shelf, like you would want to in brick and mortar. And then discussing how do you get higher up placements? Because people aren't going to take a ton of time to scroll. They're certainly not going to hit that next and get to the fifth page. So your item can look as pretty as can be. But if you're on the fifth page of lemonades, when I search for lemonade, then it's unlikely that they're going to find a Calypso. So, you know, it's definitely different questions to be asking buyers. And I think buyers are, are getting educated in this space too, especially as and say until recently, there have been different buyers for brick and mortar and for online, but now you're seeing retailers merge those. So it's different capabilities that retailers are building within their buyer set as well. What I hear Bridget saying is that on the physical shelf, it's lovely that you can do a nice brand block, all the products sit next to each other and there's a halo effect. But on the digital self, every product has to live for itself. And so doing everything you can to make sure your products get in front of the consumer, first page above the fold, that's what's going to drive success on the digital. You know, it's, it's very um, exciting as well as fulfilling to hear a chief customer officer talk to that. Because yeah, yeah. I can't tell you how many boardrooms I've been in over the course of my e-commerce career when I was on the brand side, where I would get asked these questions constantly. Why do I need to focus on the digital shelf? Why do I need to make the image better? Why is that? Why do we need a hero image? How does the order matter? Because all the entire ecosystem of CPG is built around physical packaging for the store shelf. Right, right. Description. I mean, description is another important part. I think recently about some customers that we're launching with and you get all the new item paperwork and the description of your item and how that shows up online is really important too. It's not, you know, you just don't want to have this blah, blah description of your, of your image. When somebody goes to, you know, click on it, you want it, you want to try to replicate like that experience that they would get on shelf too. And that's hard, but you know, those descriptions really matter also. So yeah, you it's know, really. SEO based title Titles and copy is an art versus a science, whereas I feel packaging physical is just a science at this stage. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So Bridget, when you're Coca-Cola, you're often the category captain at a retailer, or you're the trusted advisor. You have you know, an army of people and analysts, category advisory services to help you in engaging with, with the retailer. How do you position King Juice's role at a retailer, what's, what specific sets of capabilities do you employ to succeed as you mentioned in this very crowded competitive space? Mm -hmm. We're taking a lot of time recently, I would say over the last you know, 18 months on capability building with our team on data. 
Yeah. You know, before our, our CEO, David, will talk about this a lot before he came on board, there was limited even sales information. And so now we have the sales information with our distributors. We have VIP IDIG. We have uh, access to IRI that our teams all have access to as well. And then obviously utilizing customer data. But we've spent a lot of time building capability with our team. We've actually, as we have changed our team as well in, in um, you know, looking for people to take on a customer director role in the West, customer director role on the East, in the Central, and then with our current sales directors, looking for people that have experience and already have the capability of finding their way around data because it's so important. Because we are a smaller company and we come with fewer resources than a Coke, utilizing the data is so important for us. We have an amazing story. I mean, I have honestly never worked on a brand where we haven't needed to manipulate the data to tell the story that we wanted to, st to tell. Like all of our key metrics point in our direction. So the data really works in our favor. I'll use, I'll use a recent example with a uh, big notable retailer that I won't name. I had a meeting with the buyer earlier this week. And in preparing for this meeting and upcoming meetings for 2021 sets, we've really been digging into the IRI data. And I mean, at SKU level to see how we rank versus other SKUs. And one of the, some of the pieces of information that we wanted to bring to him were, here are some of the underperforming SKUs in your sets. And here's our performance. And if you, you know, give a top, call it seven, 10, 15, whatever, underperforming and declining. And here are four of our SKUs that if you just swapped with four, we could double and triple the business in that same space. So I think also because we are, you know, this emerging brand that we come with a bit of a, a lot of times I think bigger companies you would, if you're the category captain, I think sometimes people think that then it could lean towards that category captain. I, I don't think that that's necessarily always the case, but having someone who's not the category captain come in with the data just provides maybe an additional unbiased point of view when it's really looking at the facts. So we, we definitely use the facts to our advantage and have been building capabilities with our team to sell with the facts. Yeah, and I have to imagine that coming from the businesses you were at before, you built up a great capability and understanding of how to exactly assemble that sell story and bring that to, to this emerging business. So good on you. So speaking of emerging business, mm. you recently distributed in Hawaii. I talked about that. Congratulations. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank and you. so as you're thinking of further growth for Calypso and the brand itself, are you segmenting on the basis of a channel, your ge geography, What's next for you folks and how do you go about growth? And then when it comes to your most important KPI, of course, we come from the beverage world, equalized cases and ounces was our term, but is that the single most important thing? Not the single most important thing for us. I would say, um, again, when we, the, the first item for our sell story is really our velocity and being the fastest turning. For us, the other metrics that we're always looking at are around distribution. You know, yes, volume, yes, market share, distribution is a key component for us. So to your question around, you know, how are we segmenting? We definitely uh, work on segmenting our distributors and customers to think about how do we work with our distributors and retailers differently. But distribution would be our number one opportunity. And I would say, you know, there are, there are opportunities within grocery for sure. I would tell you our business is stronger out West. We have a lot of opportunity in the Northeast. So we've spent a lot of time focusing on the Northeast and prioritizing those customers. But across the US, you know, there are different pockets as you start to dig into the regional customers and those regional retailers that really make a difference in, you know, a state or a larger geography. And so within each of our uh, region sales managers and, and sales directors, we uh, utilize a, a tool called Shelf Space, where then we've prioritized those customers and we have a you know, a tracking mechanism where we're able to input all the information and keep track on how's the progress with selling with the buyer, what are the next steps, uh, what do we need to do to, to get the sale, when's the reset date, and when can we start selling in cases to our distributor. So um, yeah, a lot of work put around that, but I would say distribution from a metric point of view on how we continue to progress is probably one of our, one of our key, key success metrics right now. Pandemic. 
uh, wreaked havoc on just about everybody's supply chain. Would love to know to what degree that had an impact on, on your ability to get the product into distribution. And has that changed since the pandemic has extended? And also with respect to engaging, because you're trying to get more, more points of distribution, how would you say that virtual meeting versus in-person meeting has affected your ability to succeed? Sure. So first on the supply chain, um, yes, I, I mean, I think that we are in a you know, group of many uh, with supply chain constraints. And really, a lot of that came because we had a, a massive increase in demand for the product. So it's not like we were running short on raw materials or anything like that. You know, we do use glass, but, you know, aluminum, I think those that are in aluminum, they're the same though with, with demands. So it wasn't necessarily that, it was that we had this just crazy increase in demands and that caused us to extend some lead times. We've been working with distributors like all since and, and retailers that we go direct with all since the start of the pandemic on managing through that and have needed to you know, shift some lead times depending on the geography and transportation time, but to keep everyone in stock as much as possible. And I would say our distribution network has been fantastic. Some have you know, taken on more inventory really to minimize any type of out of stock in the market. And then the next one on virtual meetings. I, I actually think this has been a huge benefit for us. And, and I love to travel, so it's not like I don't wanna get on the road. I mean, I was gone three weeks, three nights every week, but I do think that the this shift to virtual right now is leveling the playing field a little bit. It, it, it definitely is because of the performance of the brand, no doubt that we're getting a lot of response, I think from buyers and all of that. But like I said, I think it's leveling the playing field because if people aren't meeting in person, you know, if I have an office in name your name your city in the US and there's a retailer close by, it's not like they're able to get together in person as frequently as they used to. So everyone is relying on these Zoom meetings. And so I think we've been able to get, you know, more than our fair share of time in front of buyers because everyone's doing it virtually and emails. Um, responses. So we've we've seen an uptick and better collaboration with retailers during this since the pandemic. So have you had any kid photo bombs during Zoom meetings yet? Because my daughter loves to do this. Yeah, I've had to. Well, now I'm actually back working at my workspace, but um, I was at home obviously in the beginning of this for a while and. Uh, would have to lock the door. And the couple times that didn't lock the door, certainly Cameron, my five-year-old would come and he'd pop his head in and want to say hi to everybody. Um, but besides that, it would just be like noises in the background, but yeah, yeah a few. And, and recently with the buyer, um, his dog was like biting his leg. And so next thing you know, the dog is on his lap for the rest of our meeting, which totally cool. I also, you know, it, I think it's humanized people also. Right? I'm sorry. It humanizes, it connects you to people. So I actually like, like it. Yeah. I think it's quite remarkable. Yeah, I, I get amused listening to all of you living away from the cities talk about how difficult it is to work remotely. I live in New York City in Manhattan and uh, we're a family of four. My two kids very much at home. There is no concept of office space. You take existing rooms where you also sleep in, eat in and do other things in, <laughs> and you also create an office space. Move the camera five degrees. Uh -huh. yeah. Not even five, like three, three degrees and 47 three. minutes and 16 seconds, that yeah. kind yeah. of thing. But yeah. speaking of convenience, Obviously, retailers like 7-Eleven, GoPuff have really emerged in the e-commerce world in a big way. And uh, clearly, it's a promising channel. Beverages, convenience, you promising sell, channel. You sell single serve. They all come together. Mm -hmm. So do you think this is a future for y'all to participate in? And do you see others entering the space as well because of the convenience factor? For sure. I mean... I I think, and especially during this pandemic time, you know, the amount of people who are ordering online now and doing, you know, curbside pickup and all of that. So definitely having some type of e-commerce strategy is, is critical. Where, you know, we're playing right now is more in the digital shelf and being available for those that order online, pick up in store. 
not so much, and, and some of it has to do with glass, but not so much with you know Amazon and delivery that way, but working with retailers who are ordering online and then delivering whatever service that, that they're using. But for sure, I mean, that's you can, you can order anything now on your phone and get it within minutes or a couple hours or geez, if you have to wait till the next day to get it. So, and we have, we have quite a lot of demand. We get all, all the consumer emails that come, they come to my phone. So I see them every day and the amount of people who, you know, request to get cases um, is really remarkable. So there's definitely a demand there for us. I always like to think about business from the Wayne Gretzky perspective. Don't go where the puck is, go where the puck is going. So in that light, What are some of the key transformations that you're watching in the retail industry that pertain to immediate consumption beverage that are really catching your attention? Some of the innovation I think is interesting on like different health and wellness, um, different ingredients that people are using, packaging. I mean, different packaging that's that's being used, I think is is pretty interesting to watch as well. Um, I was just on a health and wellness webcast a couple of weeks ago. It was just, I, I signed up to, to, to listen to it and they were talking about, you know, 11 health and wellness trends. And I thought some of the, again, it was more about like ingredients and packaging, you know, you've got this whole, not like it's new, but just emerging more now, but plant-based and, and like where that's going. So outside of just immediate consumption, because quite honestly, you know, people, people, it's not like in their wallet, they have this amount of dollars that they're going to spend on immediate consumption. They've got their money that they're going to spend for anything. Yeah, I think there's a lot of cool innovation out there for us to look at. I think alcohol also has a lot of cool innovation for different categories to look at. One of my clients is uh, Buzz Balls, and I'm absolutely amazed at that business, the, the pre-mixed quick hit cocktail and how rapidly that business is growing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So when you're not selling Calypso beverages and you're not on the CPG guys recording a podcast, you're also in the community volunteering for the Boys and Girls Club. Can you tell us more about that experience and how it's been richness and fulfillment in your own personal life? And what is your advice for those who seek the similar pursuit of altruism as you? Yeah, thanks. Um, I My background is actually in special education. So when I was graduating college, um, or, you know, I thought that maybe I'd be a teacher. And then um, partway through, I, I had some experiences at college that lended itself more towards a business. Uh, business is what I wanted to get after. And, um, but I always wanted to have that volunteerism um, aspect and work with kids primarily is really what I what I was interested in. And so through when I was working with Coke and they had such a strong partnership with Special Olympics and that really and Boys and Girls Club. So that really, you know, lent itself to um, volunteering with those organizations, moving to Minneapolis, same thing. Um, and then coming to Connecticut and, and getting married and having a family and thinking about the values of our family and we want what we want our kids to um, connect with and be a part of. You know, uh, my husband and I do a lot with our church and volunteer, volunteerism through the church. Uh, within Stanford, Connecticut, there is a, an organization called Inspirica that I volunteered for as well. And then our son had just started kindergarten. And through the Stanford School District, they have a, uh, a, a volunteerism program. And actually through COVID, I ended up doing a, being a homework mentor to a fourth grader. And I really love that because there was just so much other craziness. And I think that being able to take time apart and work with somebody else through whether it was mentoring and, you know, it was this fourth grader, but, you know, I also recently had a call with an Emory student, a previous Emory student where I got my MBA and a Penn State current student who was just looking for some career advice. Like, I love that because I feel like I'm able to take some of my experiences and give that back to somebody else because I know that has That's what's helped me get here is through other people that I've worked with. So um, it really just gives me a personal sense of fulfillment. And so I just, I I try to make time for it. I prioritize it. And it's something that's important to our family too. And, you know, something that we want our kids to be a part of in the future. Thank you so much for sharing with us and our audience about that focus in your life. I, I think as much as we like to talk about our business, talking about how we contribute to the community is critically important. There's no greater gift than giving back. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. 
Thank so you. So let me remind our audience that all of our content, podcasts, downloads, and audio format, video YouTube channel, Adam Rose's glossary of e-commerce terminology, all you have to do to find it is go to cpgguys.com and you'll find it there. And if you can go to tinyurl.com slash Apple CPG podcast, leave us feedback in the form of a rating and review. Yes, that's what I do, ratings and reviews. Uh, but Shreen, I read every single piece of, of, of uh, feedback. If you want to slide into our DMs, did I sound, was I hip when I said that? <laughs> that's very hip. Just message us. Instagram account. In I know. Me Sorry. Message us on LinkedIn, Instagram, What's whatever. What's going to happen when you get on TikTok? I'm not. Okay. We, we've we pulled our audience. They said no to TikTok. Stephen, She's shocked. Look I know. That. Stephen Carroll at, at Sam's Club said, no, you got to get on TikTok. Gee, I wonder why. Um, he's a little biased. But, um, uh, and also if you want to listen to us and you're walking around the house, you got a home virtual assistant, just ask him or her to play the CPG Guys podcast. Boom, we're in your house like that. Does it sound something like, Alexa, play the CPG Guys oh, podcast? Oh, now you just set off like, we have like 500 people now have their Alexa going. That was smart, Shree, <laughs> by design. Bridget, thank you so much for joining us today. This was a great conversation. Thank you, Bridget. It's, thank I, you. I love, I, we've stayed connected for for quite a number of years. I love our interaction. I'm so glad we got to bring you on here to talk about your new business. Shri and I will be consumers of your product. I've had quite a number of them. I love your light line, by the way. Thank, Thank you. you for adding that big, big fan of the Delicious. light line. Delicious. Thank um, you, five calories, zero sugar. Can you let our audience uh, know where they can learn more about, uh, about your brand? Yes, yes, uh, drinkcalypso.com. Uh, we also have an Instagram uh, page, Instagram, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn. So drinklipso.com. That is awesome. Like, and the offers on the table, if you ever need distribution help yeah, in Tahiti, perhaps Costa Rica, please do let us know. Antarctica, you're in. All right. Sri, as yeah. always, appreciate you joining me on this fabulous adventure. Thank you, Peter. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Bridget. All right. Thanks, for our guys. audience, thanks again for joining us. Listen to this episode of the podcast, and we look forward to you joining us for the very next episode of the CPG Guys. Goodbye, everyone.